So welcome, everybody. I'm going to try and give an introduction. Sorry for the de technical difficulties. Uh, I'm going to introduce while I'm admitting people from this waiting room. So I'm very happy that everybody is finally here uh, for a workshop on teaching biological physics. So uh, just 30 seconds pretending to be Nancy. Nancy is running. Uh, she's the chair of the DBIO engagement committee, and she's organized the whole series of these workshops. So uh, in the chat, you can find the, the link to future workshops. And the next one in particular is on communicating biophysics, including panelists Philip Ball and uh, Ragu, uh, who, um, and, and possibly one other. And so if you're interested in that or other ones, uh, please do continue to join us. It doesn't seem to be in the chat for those that joined recently. Oh, okay. Let me re just recopy it then. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, one second. Let me try again. Everyone in meeting. There we go. All right, that should be there now. Um, okay, now on to today. Um, so we have um, a, a very exciting uh, triplet of panelists, Bill Bialik from Princeton, uh, Lisa Lep Lepidus from uh, Michigan State and uh, Phil Nelson from Penn. And um, the topic of today is on everything about teaching biological physics. So just a word or two, it's many of you probably feel that it's an exciting time for biological physics education because as was sort of christened by the recent decadal survey um, that was chaired by Bill, um, it's biological physics has sort of taken its place as a standalone alone subfield of physics. And yet it hasn't really been established um, maybe to a consistent degree yet um, as having its place within uh, traditional physics education. And so that presents challenges, but maybe also opportunities as, uh, as we navigate that. Teaching biological physics is also a very big topic. It covers um, everything from integrating it into introductory physics courses to sort of spreading it throughout the physics major to you know focusing in at the graduate level. And I think as you'll hear from our panelists, um, they, they, they sort of have experience in all of those domains. Um, and so we'll be uh, touching upon those domains based upon your interest in this workshop. So, Without further ado, um, I have asked the panelists to each uh, present one slide as a way of uh, introducing themselves and sort of telling us about the efforts they've been involved in recently in this field. And so in alphabetical order, I'm gonna now turn it over to uh, Bill Bialik to kick that off. Bill. Thanks, let me um, put up my one slide. Um, so, uh, the slide was chosen to begin by reminding everybody that that um, we have problems on uh, educational issues on many different scales. Um, I think that that as physicists, we should be concerned about how we teach physics much more broadly. Um, I, I don't think uh, it's too controversial to say that most of the of today's undergraduate, certainly physics curriculum, was settled uh, quite some time ago. Um, many people commit the sin of teaching the course that they took in graduate uh, when they were students. Um, I think this is a problem for physics very broadly. Um, there are a couple of quotes here that are drawn from the decadal survey. The, the text in red um, is, is a link where you can find um, the whole report. Um, you know, there is this sense that somehow physics has had its day and we are in the century of biology and computer science. And I don't I, I don't think that's unrelated to the fact that um, uh, we we teach in a somewhat old fashioned way. Maybe some of the blame rests with us uh, and not only with others. And then uh, particularly for those of us who are interested in the phenomena of life, there's a large scale problem, which is that um, students uh, can get perfectly good uh, undergraduate degrees in physics and not realize that there is a subject called biological physics. Um, and that really sort of can't happen for our colleagues in elementary particle physics or condensed matter physics or other areas. 
Um, so there's these are kind of large scale issues. Um, and of course, uh, there are also issues about the relationship of uh, our field to the larger efforts to, to educate more quantitative biologists and so on. Um, I've been involved in some experiments that address some of these issues uh, with a group of colleagues. Uh, we developed a, a, a new course for first year undergraduates that combined physics, chemistry, biology, um, and has been a sort of an alternative introduction. Um, it's unified around the kinds of mathematical tools that we use to describe nature. And students who pass through that course have gone on to major in all of the sciences and actually some you know, the arguments for why it's a good introductory course are also an argument for why it's a, a good only course in physics. So, so many people have even gone on to do um, things in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, so that's something I could talk about if people are interested. Um, uh, I've had the, the pleasurable assignment of teaching the statistical physics course for juniors uh, several times and have tried. That's a place where I think we come squarely up against this sort of ossified curriculum um, and we teach things that are so far, you know, there's been sort of revolution in our understanding of statistical physics and and that's not represented at all um, in the standard course. And so I, like many of you on this call, I've probably, uh, I'm, I suspect uh, I've tried to do something about that. Um, I also had the good fortune to teach a biophysics course that was aimed at physics PhD students as opposed to having to meet a multidisciplinary audience um, and that resulted in a book uh, which is now 10 years old so uh, that is what it is um, and uh, I've also uh, enjoyed being involved in intense summer courses which um, somehow are uh, a little orthogonal to our usual um, questions about about teaching at the university but of course play a crucial role um, particularly for more advanced students so there are big problems. Uh, like many of you, I've dabbled in different parts, um, and that exhausts uh, my introductory time. So, all right, thank you, Bill. Uh, Lisa, oh, you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> I'm Lisa Lapidus. I'm at Michigan State University. Um, I have worked on. Um, teaching biophysics at the graduate level um, as well as the undergraduate level but what I've spent most of my time on recently is working at the introductory physics level for life science students um, and so uh, over the past several years we've developed a new curriculum uh, which I was told had to have an acronym so it is P at MCL physics at the molecular and cellular level um, so uh, like Bill I have some similar opinions um, most universities don't have this unified physics, chemistry, biology introductory course. Rather, what you have are, you know, you usually have a life science student take two terms of physics, and that's the only physics course that they'll ever see. Um, and echoing Bill, it's basically the same content that was taught decades ago. Um, so we tend to cover 16th century ballistics and 19th century electrostatics. So if you wanted to hit a cannonball to the side of a castle, you, we've got you covered there, but we don't really have anything that is kind of more relevant to uh, modern science. And we tend to fill in the gaps with a grab bag of topics that are really more suitable for engineering. Um, and if you put biology in this course at all, it is basically what I would call trees and skeletons. It is highly simplified biological models. It also tends to be macroscopic biology, which physicists think is what biologists think about. But um, as we probably all know, um, introductory biology now is basically um, entirely molecular and cellular. Um, and so all students have this common language. Um, and molecular biology is pretty easy to teach if you include computation. Um, so we've designed the course in two focus areas. The first semester, which of course is the traditional mechanics course, um, the focus is diffusion. And that allows us to spend a lot more time talking about statistical mechanics than um, you normally cover in an introductory course. 
Uh, the second semester is the traditional e &M, and we focus on electric dipoles, which gives us the ability to discuss the basis for molecular interactions with light, which of course is very important in a lot of molecular and cellular topics. So that's just a big brief introduction into kind of the challenges that we've had in um, using this curriculum. Um, I'm happy to talk about implementation. We have um, are now scaled up to teach um, about 600 students per semester. Um, we have labs, so we have all kinds of details. Um, and then I will um, do my shameless plug for um, a website that I've recently put together that has all of our materials available for people to use and share. I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Lisa. And Phil. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Phil Nelson. I'm at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, let me share my screen. And I too have a shameless plug to start out with. Uh, one moment, please. Uh, I want everybody to be aware of a relatively new journal on biophysics education. And uh, there it is. And uh, you can find interesting articles in there about other people's experiments, but you can also contribute interesting articles about your own interesting experiences. And uh, we'd love to hear from you, but that's not really the topic of today's meeting. Still, I'll put it there. And while I'm at it, I'll put my own email in the chat. Right, so um, let me talk now about Oh. oh, yeah, slide two. So we've heard people say, your screen sharing is paused. Um, I still see slide one. Yeah, exactly. OK. Uh, I can share slide two if you need me to. Give me one brief moment. Okay. Well, Andrew, we better go back to plan B then. Thank you. <laughs> All right, one second. Right, thanks. So. Yeah. As was mentioned by the other people, uh, there are many aspects of biological physics and we don't have to sequester them into one elective course that some students will not take. That's a good thing. It's important to have that elective course, but uh, if many students don't take it, then they'll still leave undergraduate or even graduate school unaware of the existence of this field that we claim is important. So. Uh, when we think about integrating biological physics into the curriculum, you know, the first thing we think about is first year physics, and that's important. That's where the big numbers are, as Lisa explained it. But now let's think about what comes after first year physics. Um, most physics departments teach a course called modern physics, which means up till 1925. And well, there's a lot of things you can put in that. If you think of climate as a physiological system, uh, you can say a lot of things that students are very interested in about uh, the feedbacks involved in climate once they know a little bit about black body radiation and so on. Uh, you can talk to them about wave and particle duality. Uh, what about this new kind of microscopy that didn't exist 20 years ago that simultaneously uses both the wave and the particle characters of light in a single measurement to give you, you know, unprecedented viewpoints on things. That's very interesting to students. Okay, some of them may even be doing research in a lab that uses one of these technologies and they are interested in knowing what it's all about. Uh, what can you talk about in upper level mechanics? Well, you can say more about fluids than you could say in first year physics. You know, you can solve some uh, Navier-Stokes equations and uh, find some drag, but you can also in particular find the drag on a anisotropic object and suddenly you're in a position to start talking about flagellar propulsion which is how E. coli gets around. And, you know, that's something that's really interesting to a lot of students is fits nicely in that course. Uh, 
upper level electrodynamics? Well, you know, everything in first year physics is usually done in vacuum. And hardly any experiments are actually done in vacuum. A lot of experiments are done in aqueous solution. And it's about time that we uh, said, you know, electrodynamics is strangely different in aqueous solution. Forces are short range. That's critically important for molecular recognition and molecular recognition is the basis of all cell biology. So uh, that's something we can usefully say in a in M course, it's different from the same old stuff. Uh, membrane potentials, action potentials, uh, those are all things that fit nicely in there. And each of these could be just like a one week module that you stick in. You can certainly find one week of stuff that isn't that important to squeeze out to make room for a little biological physics alongside all those other applications to all those other well-established domains of physics that have been there forever. If you teach a course on quantum mechanics, you can ask about uh, the single photon sensitivity of animal eyes, not just human eyes, uh, even insects have single photon sensitivity. How is it even discovered? And you can also get back to localization microscopy and say, well, what does it mean to switch a floor for on and off? Uh, you know, there's forbidden and permitted transitions. And uh, that's something you can talk about by the time you get into quantum mechanics. StatMech, uh, Bill touched upon that, free energy, Anyone who takes a course in PCHEM thinks that free energy is only uh, applicable to whole moles of stuff. Uh, it's applicable to single molecules. And once you get that, then you can do one of the most simple and satisfying calculations of free energy available is the one involved in stretching single molecules of DNA. So uh, just from the pedagogical point of view, whether you're interested in biological physics or not, that's a tremendous example that's not in books. Uh, condensed matter, well, you know, there's, we talk about depletion layers in the context of PN junctions, but uh, they're pretty important in uh, membrane biophysics as well. And you can just keep on going. Why should you stop talking about biological physics when you get to the graduate curriculum? You can talk about proton therapy. You can talk about electrocardiograms. You can talk about a lot of uh, medical and biological topics in grad e &M and uh, grad quantum mechanics. If you want to understand force to resonance energy transfer, you got to understand quantum decoherence. It's not something you can talk about in first year physics. You can talk about it in advanced courses. So I wanted to keep this brief so that we'd have time for your questions and so on. Uh, this is just a little smorgasbord of things. And uh, if you're interested in how to actually implement any of those, you know, I have done almost all of those as modules and courses I teach. And uh, you can contact me because I've written many of them up. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Phil, and, and to all the panelists. So hopefully, we, we were hoping this would give you sort of a flavor of uh, some of the expertise of the panelists. Um, so there's luckily, uh, despite technical difficulties, there's still plenty of time to um, start a discussion now. So what I'd like to ask people to do is either to do the raising of, of a hand on Zoom, and then uh, we can we can just have you ask your question. Uh, to the panelists directly, or you can put it in the chat and I'll, I'll read it out. So it looks like we already have a, a hand, a two hands raised. So um, shoot, there's a lot of Nancy Fords. So uh, the person raised, who raised their hand who is not Daniel Fisher, <laughs> would you please ask your question? Daniel, you can go next. Sure, I'm Sam Saffron and I'm at the Weizmann Institute of uh, Science in a department called Chemical and Biological Physics, uh, which is officially in the chemistry faculty. And first, I want to thank Phil for the plug for the Journal of the Biophysicist. Uh, Patricia Soto, who's in the audience, and I are also associated with that journal. And I second Phil's invitation to all of you to read and participate as authors. Uh, I just wanted to comment, uh, I felt a somewhat apologetic air, and I understand that air, and have also been in sometimes, uh, sometimes expressed that in justifying uh, ourselves to physics departments in terms of courses, students, research, is it physics or is it not? And uh, I'm very, very aware of that, because although our department is in the Faculty of Chemistry. I teach soft matter to then biological physics to physicists and interact with uh, the PIs in physics quite a bit. Uh, and I think uh, 
this discussion with the pure physics faculty has to go on until we're successful. But I think that one can uh, take a route to sort of sidetrack the discussion. And this is something that I have done in teaching. I, I, my course like would start with a whole bunch of uh, first or second year master's students, 30 in our case or 40, and then about two or three weeks in, uh, half of them leave and they say, this is in physics, this is chemistry, you draw, you drew a molecule. It was a, a, a wiggly surfactant or lipid tail and a, and a polar head and, and mentioned molecules, of course, because they, they are the heart of biology. Uh, and, and this is not physics. And so I say, okay, that's how, you know, and these, these young kids say, I'm going to be a string theorist. You know, they know this in their, their uh, sixth month of uh, graduate school. And I say, fine. And to the others who remain, and many of them get it, I say, look, there is no physics, chemistry, biology, even some parts of engineering. There's really only science. And there's scientific questions that we're interested in and different ways of understanding those questions. You could do it by being a biologist and you'll ask different questions. A chemist on the same problem would ask a different question and a physicist would ask a different question. And I think one of the things that we have to tell our fellow physics colleagues is that our field does not close doors in physics. It opens doors to the rest of science. And I really feel strongly about this in terms of my own career, my own interactions, my own institute. Uh, and, and, and that was the reason that our department in which out of six biological physicists, one is a physical chemist and all the rest are card carrying physicists, why we uh, were organized in the Faculty of Chemistry, which is much more broad minded in our institution. So I'm sorry if I took too long, but I, I think that it's something for all of us to keep in mind and to go with their heads raised, not only with respect to physics and what it is and should be, and I support that, but with respect to what we're doing for science. Very good. Thank you for that comment. Um, I want to give the panelists a chance to respond to that comment and, and let Daniel uh, ask the question. But I also want to say, you know, let's focus the discussion a little bit. As, as I mentioned, teaching biological physics, as you've heard, can be sort of introductory level, mid uh, upper level, or, or at the graduate level. And just like all the other technical difficulties, we can't do a Zoom poll. So if you want to focus on one of those three levels, pop it in the chat, and, and that'll help us focus the discussion. Um, before we move on to Daniel, is there any comments from the from the panelists about sort of the relationships between physics departments and perhaps chemistry or, or biology departments? I mean, I think I, I guess th this is to to agree that these are these are sort of parallel problems that you know there are things that happen that are outside there there are things that, that need to happen inside physics departments and that in some sense the physics department has complete control over so that's sort of good news and bad news um physics departments have inertia but on the other hand there's some well-defined set of people that you, that you need to convince um and you share culture and then there are the things that happen in you know outside uh that involve interacting with other departments and these things need to be pursued in parallel I like, I, I think the, the idea that problems don't come labeled, you know, phenomena in the world don't come labeled by discipline, but the kinds of questions that we ask and the kinds of answers that we expect are what define our discipline. And, and I, you know, I, of course, we can be partisan for our own discipline, but. Um... So if I can put in one comment, um, so to bring this back to the subject of education, as Bill said, you know, the physics department generally gets to decide what's in the courses that they teach. And one of the challenges that I've found in our department is the reluctance of my fellow physics faculty to engage with biology faculty that are still, of course, in our college to say, what is it that you want to hear? What is it that you want to learn? And so I think that at least at the level of what are we going to actually offer in terms of courses, getting our 
colleagues to actually go talk to people outside the department to say, you know, what are we looking for um, if you're teaching a non-physicist is a really important conversation to have. Yeah, Phil, you have your hand raised. Is that because you also want to well, comment? Well, can I just add that, you know, modern approaches to data analysis are not really part of the standard physics curriculum either. And uh, that's another thing that uh, even our most resistant colleagues will understand that that's an important thing to get into the curriculum everywhere possible. Right, you can certainly get a whole degree in physics and never hear the words basis formula in my department unless you hear it from me. So that's another thing we can add. Thanks. Um, so Daniel, do you want to unmute? Yes. Um, so I wanted to talk specifically about the, the, the physics uh, physics majors. So when a lot of students who were turned off by biology in 10th grade, um, never took a biology course all the way through um, college, um, come to graduate school and some non-negligible um, number end up as professors in departments with bio in the uh, um, title, or at least calling themselves biological physics. So there's obviously something really wrong about not exposing them. It seems that what and people have been talking about not entirely, but mostly as far as the physics ones, is trying to sneak little bits of physics in biology things into physics courses, rather than saying one is going to try to teach physics ways of thinking about biological questions and really focusing on the biological questions and then the physics approaches to them rather than the um, uh, you know, finding the physics in, in biology. And I think one's missing a tremendous um, opportunity in there, and specifically the notion of biological function. Right? I mean, as many of us know from teaching, starting with chemotaxis and building it up from um, molecular level and building it down from behavioral level and so on, touches on all kinds of physics things and brings in a lot, a lot of molecular biology, which we could teach, um, uh, teach along the way. Um, it seems the biggest difficulty I mean, to me on talking to colleagues and trying to convince them anything is that one has to convince colleagues to drop some of the upper level undergraduate requirements, at least if they're going to have you know, biophysics option or something on the on the um, on the physics major. So I guess I had two questions. One was sort of why why take the approach of the sort of incrementalist approach of little bits of biology into existing physics classes. And the second was if anyone can report on successes on convincing their um, the physics colleagues to drop, say, upper level mechanics and upper level ENM, which are basically applied math um, courses. I, mean, I could I could give a try. So um, let's see. So the, there are two issues here. I mean, uh, so I teach at an institution where the physics department, um, as as you know, Daniel, since you also taught there, um, uh, the 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 list of upper division of, of upper division requirements is actually quite short, um, which has other issues, um, and it's I it's partly because of the ideology of the university more broadly, but I think also a sense that you want to leave room for people to to sample more broadly. Um, so in that sense, uh, I mean, I, I it wasn't my doing and it wasn't specifically in response to the growth of biological physics, but certainly the list of the list of, of upper division requirements is very short. Um, and then in terms of of uh convincing people that that there's a there's a biological physics uh sort of core um the graduate course that i mentioned by now the way in which we insist that our graduate students have a broad background in physics is we ask them to take courses from multiple categories um and the biological physics course counts as one of those courses and so there is a kind of uh departmental requirement that it be taught at a certain level. And so that it's not just, you know, oh, here's a cute example of some physics thing you can do in biology, but but it has to be done done more seriously. I think I think the incrementalist versus um I, I, I think that that the that providing examples of uh, in which thinking about the phenomena of life illustrates basic physical principles. Um, maybe the boundary you want that you want is whether 
It's some principle you wouldn't have thought of if you hadn't thought about the biological case. Uh, that's harder at an introductory level. Um, maybe it's harder more generally. Um, but I, I think that 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 people, students develop a kind of aversion to the complexity of of biology. You know, I mean, we. It, uh, I guess Sam was talking about, you know, the fact that you drew a molecule made it seem like it wasn't a physics course. Um, so the, the, the aversion to complexity is even before you get to anything that's alive. And so somehow we need to, we need, we need to get rid of that. And um, that's somehow built into the core courses. And I, I don't think that would be an incremental change if people came out without that aversion. But others, others will have yeah, Phil, I noticed you put something in the chat about uh, e &M. Do you want to expand upon that? Um, or not? <laughs> it's kind of a self-explanatory point, but uh, let me ask the audience if they're interested in the issue of creating a biophysics major at your institution, if you don't have one already. That's another topic we might want to get into and its relationship with the existing courses. There's also the, the bio option in a physics major, which I think some quite a few places try to do. And I think it's that's at least something that one should make real on there. So have you done this, Phil, at Penn? We have a biophysics major, even though we have no biophysics department. And uh, we have found that the, uh, the cost of entry is surprisingly low. We have one dedicated biophysics course and we pluck all the other courses from various existing major offerings and uh, this way we get a cadre of a surprisingly large number of biophysics majors who then in turn uh, support the enrollment in the biophysics class and it's kind of a good synergy so uh, so it sounds like with with limited buy-in in other words you might only need one person one departmental faculty who does research one, in biophysics to, to do this. dedicated right? course yeah exactly and and then other courses drawn from graduate and undergraduate pro, uh, departments yeah. throughout the university yeah so people who are interested in that uh, we could talk about that too so i want to make sure to uh ask a few or get a few questions from the chat here vernita gordon are you here do you want to just unmute yeah, this wasn't really a question. It was just a, you asked for topics we'd like. To oh, I see. On. Okay. And yeah. the thing I've thought about a lot is that our courses don't really talk about concepts in terms of biophysics, except for the undergraduate biophysics course that I teach sometimes, but not a lot because I have other things I want to do. And I'd really like to see biophysics content integrated in the undergraduate curriculum is sort of like a public service thing in the graduate curriculum, because I'd really like it if the courses my graduate students are required to take had some relevance to them. In principle, I would like to do this. In reality, there is absolutely no way I have the time and energy to do it. So how could we like make this possible without just overwhelming the bio faculty at institutions, especially if it's like mine and it's overwhelmingly a non-bio department? Yeah, and maybe I can add to that a related point would be even if you integrate it into all the courses, a lot of the times you have to have buy in from the all the other faculty who don't think about biological physics every day in order to like, you know, sincerely accept that and 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 adopt that and and in, in their own courses. So I wonder if the panelists have thoughts on uh, these points. Yeah, so I, can say, I can address that. Yeah. So I think that's a big problem that we have as well. Um, so even just teaching this introductory course, there's resistance from the faculty to participate in a course which is basically laid out for them because they're like, well, I don't know any biology. I can't possibly teach this class. And so I'm very sympathetic to that because I was a traditionally trained physicist who only um, started doing biological physics as a postdoc. So I know what the process is of having to learn it. And the most important thing that I understood from that as a postdoc was that I did not have to know all biology in order to be able to understand specific biological topics, and that I actually understood a lot more than I thought I did because it's still mostly physics, right? 
So one of the things that as a community we could do is to start um, putting together more materials for traditional physicists to explain the basic concepts we'd like them to understand and, and incorporate into their courses without getting into the biological detail that sends physicists running for cover because they hate that stuff. Um, and so I've started by putting together a series of explainers that, you know, in a very short amount of space, uh, you know, uh, taking up very little space explains what a protein is without going through a million details that a typical biochemist might go through. Um, I've also made videos about some of the materials that we actually teach, which help the faculty who are teaching with me understand how they're going to interpret the, the materials when they teach it. So, you know, I think, and, and I don't think this needs to be specific to a particular um, department. I think if there was, you know, the handbook of biology for physicists that could be put together by the community, there would be um, a much easier thing a much easier barrier for physicists who have no biology experience to say, okay, I can teach some of this stuff because I now have a book that tells me what I need to know. In your specific case, have you reached the point where your course has a life beyond you teaching it? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and in fact, this semester, I will not be teaching the course that is teaching most of the students. I'm, I'm teaching the kind of op cycle class. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I want to get another question from the chat. Patricia Soto, are you here? Do you want to unmute? Yes, uh, I'm here. I'm going to read the question. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I do curricular reform at my institution. We are a primarily undergraduate institution in the US. We have a big population of pre-health students. But then the, the issue that I have been facing is how, what, what are the learning outcomes that I expect from the courses that I reform? And what I have found is that so far in biological physics, the learning outcomes depend a lot on the instructor. Like I feel there is no, I, I don't wanna say a full consensus, but at least a set of learning outcomes that I could uh, pick from right and, and and have an agreement an agreement with the whole community so so that's my question how can we agree on what needs to go in a biological physics course at the different levels thoughts so I know that there was a, um, a report prepared um, that was mostly put down by the physics education community, um, physics education research community, PER, uh, about teaching physics, uh, introductory physics for the life sciences, so IPLS. They're very fond of acronyms. Um, and uh, they said a lot of the things that I think we're saying here. But then at the very end, they said, and every department has to be customizing their course to the needs of their students because biology students are so different. And I really disagree with that idea um, because I really think that it's not whether they are going to be, um, you know, an ecologist versus a nurse or whatever. You know, it's not where their career is going, it's what are they actually learning while they're sitting in our course in other courses. And since there is actually a fair amount of introductory biology uniformity, and that has been worked on a lot with the you know, similar kind of decadal um, reports, I think we probably could come up with something that says this is what we think, um, uh, you know, this is the level of biology we think physicists ought to know, um, and that it really shouldn't be, uh, you know, so particular to what, you know, a particular department wants to do. It should, there really should be some standards, but we would have to write them down. Um, and that might be something that DBio ought to be doing. Do you think this question is easier to answer at the introductory level rather than 
the more advanced well, level where things get more specialized. Yeah. Because, you know, I wouldn't even think that there's that much standardization in how you teach thermo and stat mech from one university to the next, right? Um, so yeah, so certainly at the upper level, everybody's gonna put their own little uh, imprint on their courses. Um, but you could probably come up with a set of um, topics that you think are the, you know, the things we can most agree on are relevant to physics majors that contain biological material. Um, but, you know, introductory courses are obviously easier to standardize. Uh, maybe I, I could add something about this. I mean, I, I think it's important to remember that that some disciplines have very strong sort of regulatory apparatus for education. So for example, the engineers, right, getting an engineering degree is both um, a, a matter of education, but also a matter of path toward professional licensing. So what you teach in engineering courses, in, in engineering curricula is actually carefully, um, carefully regulated. Um, the physics community has resisted this. Um, the, the only place where we step over is precisely in some of the introductory courses that, that Lisa's talking about, because um, the introductory physics course for life science majors, um, one of its primary functions, whether we like it or not, is to prepare students to take the, rel to take the MCAT exam. And so, you know, if, if the people in charge of medical education, I, I think there are people on this, on the, this one, I do, have different ideas about what parts of physics are going to show up on the MCAT, then that has a direct impact on, on, on what needs to be taught in those introductory courses. And I don't, I don't know whether that's a model or not. I think there's an interesting question about whether the physics community wants to take on a notion of standardization beyond um, the sort of vague community standards, um, a bit more like our engineering colleagues do perhaps. And I don't know whether that's a good idea or not. Um, and, and again, it has, as has already been emphasized, it's, it's important to remember the enormous diversity of contexts in which physics is taught. Um, so the vast majority of people taking a physics course at any moment um, are taking it at a community college, right? Uh, sorry, at a university level physics course. So um, as we sit comfortably in research intensive, many of us sit comfortably in research intensive institutions, expressing opining about what people should and shouldn't learn, um, we should be very, very careful um, because the sort of whole context in which that teaching is happening can be completely different from our experience. I wanna to get to a, a question from Tim Bylash in the chat that may relate to the, the diversity of institutions. Tim, do you wanna unmute? Yes, hi, thank you so much. I'm glad you're having this, appreciate whoever organized it. Uh, I, um, let me just get my note here, we were talking about, a question I have is uh, to define the ultimate goal for an educational career. Um, when you spend 10 years with a PhD and you come out and you can, you get a $30,000 postdoc appointment that you scrambled to, to get, uh, the living is an important part of this. And uh, I found, because I do my own research, I'm not at an academic institution, I'm actually a physician, but my training is strong in science and physics. And I just find when I make inquiries or send emails or try to call universities that I get no response, that essentially a lot of the academics are walled off. And, uh, and so what is the role for someone that comes out and doesn't get a big grant from the institutions or doesn't have a strong mentor? Uh, and how do you integrate that? Because it takes so long to train in physics. No answer? Uh, one option that many of our students are interested in is medical physics, which is a whole professional career of its own, and uh, for which studying biophysics is one of the better means of preparation. Nancy, I know you've had your hand up for a bit. Do you want to chime in or ask sure. a question? Again? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can just briefly comment to Tim. I know, like, from our standpoint, all of our 
seminars and colloquia are open to everyone. And we do have sometimes people from outside of academia coming to those. It's maybe a slightly different aspect than what you were alluding to. But um, yeah, I, I guess my, my question that I was thinking about a while ago was relating to the curriculum and the biological curriculum. And I guess I was interested to hear the panelists' perspective on um, graduate programs, particularly a PhD. We've had a fair bit of discussion about like what is the core curriculum for a biological physics PhD student. And for context, our, our, our university doesn't offer a biophysics graduate degree. We do an undergrad one, but not a graduate one. And so students have to take their program in either physics or molecular biology or chemistry or whatever. Um, and so from a research standpoint, there's no issues. But the physics standpoint, we have a very standard core curriculum of STATMEC and ENM and quantum. And uh, students can then take other courses in other departments to complete their program. But um, we get, we're having an increasing number of students wanting to do biological physics graduate school who are not interested in taking quantum or ENM, for example. And, uh, you know, is this, in your view, a, a requirement of a PhD program in physics that if you get that, you should have competency in these? Or uh, do you have examples of other approaches? So I can address that. Uh, so we have had a um, policy of joint PhD. Uh, programs in a bunch of different fields. Um, when I first got to MSU, what we had was a, a joint degree with biochemistry and physics. Um, and then we created something called quantitative biology, which was a different way of doing it. But again, it was a joint degree program. And the students were always admitted into uh, one of the two departments um, uh, and quantitative biology did not admit anybody. Uh, and the most important thing about that joint program, because almost everything else is sort of customizable, was that there were a reduced number of physics credits so that you could take courses outside of the department. And not only that, but there was also a reduction in the exam system. And it was a bit of a fight because there were always at some point someone saying, well, are they really a physicist if they haven't taken two semesters of quantum mechanics and that sort of thing. Um, but it does make it a lot easier for my graduate students to actually learn some usually biochemistry that they needed. So um, we are have just the uh, there's are just starting a biophysics PhD program, which is separate from from physics or from quantitative biology. So um, we tr we tried the quantitative biology uh, experiment and and that's working for many of my colleagues in other disciplines but it's not particularly working for uh for the physicists who are interested in biological problems um and and the strongest argument we had for for creating um a biophysics phd program was that we looked at other prominent biophysics phd programs around the country and we looked at the current students over the last five years and we noticed that none of them had applied either to our physics program or to our quantitative biology program. So it's clear that there is a community of students who come out of physics as undergraduates, are interested in biological problems, and somehow are not sufficiently interested in the rest of physics that they want a physics PhD, but also sufficiently tied to physics that they wouldn't want to get a degree that didn't have physics in the name. And so you know, one view is, well, tough, you know, we should beat them over the head and tell them what it is they're supposed to learn. But the other idea is that, you know, we should capture those students and hope that that by the way in which we teach will inspire them to uh, be broader in ways that are interesting and they'll find their own path. Um, and so I think I think there is a lot of space for, for that. And typically um, because they don't care, have the historical weight of a physics program or even of a traditional biology program, biophysics programs tend to be very flexible. And so students can do what they want. And so full disclosure, I actually have a PhD in biophysics. Um, and so that didn't stop, but you know, it is not forbidden for a biophysics student to take a quantum field theory course, right? Um, so conveniently. Uh, so um, 
I think that having some flexible alternative to capture these students and inspire them to do what we think what we think is interesting is a good idea. And they're not all going to turn out like us. So one extra complication is that some physics departments, including Stanford physics department, a lot of time will not accept students who say their primary interest is biophysics. That doesn't help. So that's a very different problem, yeah. So I want to stay mindful of everybody's time. I think we probably have time just for one last question. Dan Zuckerman, you've had your hand up for a bit. Hey, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, I was going to make a comment along the lines of some things that have just been coming up in terms of the different student populations. And I think you were talking about people who maybe bifurcate for graduate school. But there's also, if I think Phil was referring to the um, undergrad biophysics program. And um, I just think that there's a lot of students out there who um, are interested in biophysics, but have the, maybe it's a math fear or a physics fear, it's the formalism. And maybe they're gonna be doing experiments or whatever. And I've, I've worked with students, I'm recently working with an experimentalist who's in a bio, it's his department called biochem and biophysics. And he's been doing purely computations with me. And, and I'm like, oh, you can do that thing? Well, why don't you try this slightly more sophisticated thing? And then he can do it. And then suddenly he can do all these things. You know, these are, these are some very start, smart students who um, I think they don't have the, the confidence for whatever reason. And, and maybe, you know, they're never, they're not gonna be taking quantum field theory. And, you know, and, and they, for that matter, they might not do well in the upper division physics, but I think there's, there should be a place for them. And I think, you know, I, I know you, you all worry a lot about enrollments in your department and stuff. So I think it's worth, it's worth some thought. And then, and then the other side of that is of course the curricular materials, how are they being developed, right? Are they being developed in the old school formalistic way that we, you know, have gone through or is it a little bit more um, approachable? So I'll just, I'll stop there. Yeah, Phil, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, um, thanks, Dan. I think what you outlined is also another reason to have a separate biophysics major, so that uh, even if your colleagues feel that they have to take quantum field theory no matter what, uh, there can be a separate program with a separate set of requirements that can bring in more qualitative things, perhaps from other departments. It's just another reason to do that. All right, thank you, Phil. So I, I think um, there's many more questions we haven't gotten to. There's also resources in the chat, um, but I think in, in re with respect to the time, I think we should end here. So I just wanna thank the panelists for their insights. I wanna thank the attendees, especially all the Nancy Fords and the real Nancy Ford. Sorry for the technical difficulties and uh, we hope to see you at future editions of the DBIO virtual workshops. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, do you need to touch base with us? Uh, not necessarily. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I, thanks for your for your efforts and your input. And uh, okay. yeah, we'll be in touch. I'm sure. Okay. So, Seems like there's a lot more discussion that could happen. A lot more ideas in the chat. So maybe we should think about having another one of these. Absolutely. Depo. Uh, online events, maybe with a particular focus on, you know, physics in the undergraduate, uh, biological physics in the undergraduate curriculum or introducing yeah. physics to life science students, or I don't know, there were so many Absolutely. topics covered here that were this... all super interesting. And I could spend like hours talking about any of them. But uh, yeah, this um, is definitely it, overstuffed for for an hour. So, but it was super to see how many people were interested. Like this is our best attendance yet. So clearly, this is a passion for people in the community. Great. Can can I say something super fast? I put it in the chat. But so I know that when people develop materials for teaching, it's a lot of time and work on their part. But. I've been a part of a community on climate change where people were developing materials for connecting climate change to all kinds of different courses. Oh, I did not know that was a thing, Phil. Okay, 
So maybe this is already a thing and I just didn't know about it. But I, like for me, something that I've struggled with is how do I make this happen in my department without me falling over dead in the process? And so maybe what I need to do is look at this thing that Phil sent out because yeah. I didn't know this was a possibility. So I think the, the biggest problem with that portal, and there's a reason that I'm not using that portal for what I have um, for what I have uh, put together, is that it is very much driven by the physics education research community who are valuable, but they have a very different approach than the average biological physicist. And so we could all just invade it and you know sort of direct it in the direction we want to go in but you have to recognize that the people who are running this are of this mind that everybody should you know just pick and choose what they need and everyone has to create their own course there's no one way that it should be done whereas i think that this group of people that we just talked with really seem to think that we should be coming to some consensus about what is you know the appropriate content to be teaching um, and so uh, we would have to think about whether maybe DBIO sets up some sort of portal that is really aimed at biological physicists. So I, I'm not at all opposed to the idea of some sort of standardization, but I don't feel that we are even at that place at UT. Like we are not at the place to start thinking about that. I would just like to have like I'd like to have a stat met course talk about entropic elasticity rather than spending its entire time on the grand canonical ensemble, for example. I would just like to get some connections in because it's, I, but that's very hard in a department like mine, which is overwhelmingly non-biological and frankly kind of old school. Mm -hmm. Yep, same. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Are you looking at the portal now? <laughs> Phil is emailing me about things. Yeah. Now your books are very cheap. I also did not know that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the Living Physics Portal is still very new, so it doesn't have a ton of material on it. And it is very much dominated by the uh, ed education research. But I think that there is, there is a place where we could start to put stuff that would be more appropriate. Or we could all contribute to that portal and in so doing change its character. That's what I was trying to mm -hmm. imply at the beginning is that, you know, let's just let's put more biology I, in there. Which I admit I have not done. Well, I was actually approached this summer to actually put my website as a link. So the portal now contains me, mm -hmm. but the materials are hosted on this website because they don't have the ability to host an entire curriculum. Gotcha. Everything had to be put up piecemeal. Yeah. And I did not want that. I wanted it to be organized so you understood why it was in the order it was in. Absolutely. So that was a compromise. But you know, just so people can find that it exists, that's good exactly. to have it. And that was fine. They were happy with that. Yeah. So anyway, right. so that's just something to think of in the future, Nancy, if you wanted to try and think about ways that we could, you know, direct this more rather than being more of a, a more broad conversation, you could direct it toward well, what could we as a community do? To contribute all of the stuff that we have so that we are organized and it could be through this portal and i'm sure right. that the people running the portal would love to come talk to us yeah i think katherine crouch is one of the people who's been involved with that has, worth more she has a little bit but she's not i don't think she's directly involved in running it. okay i i met her through the last of these deep bio events on the um the cato survey and we've been having a discussion since and she came today and yeah. Um, no, I know she's involved. keen to help because they're also what they're working on right now is trying to get uh, start a project to get biological physics examples for the introductory physics courses that aren't for the life sciences. Uh, and, you know, and we have none of that in our courses because those of us who do biological physics always teach the other stream and I love teaching the other stream but since discussing with her, I'm like, I should probably go teach that course for engineers and tell them all about like DNA origami and like building things and motors and yeah. Anyway, um, uh, like, but that's also a different topic, right? Like physics, like biological physics in the intro physics curriculum, that's not the life science student stream, which would be a fascinating discussion too, so. Mm -hmm. um, well, if I get, I know we're past time, but Lisa, I was, when you were talking about your class where you, for the, the introductory physics for life sciences students, I really like the idea of teaching those topics that you introduced, 
But so I usually teach in the sequence for physics majors. And the problem I have is if I taught it the way you describe and taught those topics instead of what I usually teach, I would be completely screwing them over for subsequent courses in the major. So somehow, if we want to do this, which I think is a good idea, we have to figure out some way that if, I don't know, if, if everybody's going to expect them to know Gauss's law in second semester or whatever, like we've got to like figure out a way to, to not violate departmental expectations, even if we don't completely agree with them. Uh, I agree. And, and I think, so I, this again gets back to my kind of my, my soapbox, which is none of this should be done incrementally. You should really rethink how the course is organized um, and decide what actually should be there. And so that's what we did for the biology students. And we basically said, okay, we don't need Gauss's law um, because we're going to mostly focus on dipoles, right? And so we really only need to understand superposition and you know fields and that sort of thing. Um, and the same thing in the mechanics course. So if you were to try and say, okay, there should be more um, biology in a course for physics majors, you have to go back and start at the beginning and say, well, what are the things that would be most important? And so if you wanted to try and teach entropy in terms of DNA stretching, you have to go back and say, okay, well, what did you need to know before that? How do you go back to that? And then what are the things that maybe a physics major doesn't need to see in the first semester so that it's not um, you know, so that it could come up later and it would matter to them. You know, they spend a lot of time studying rotation. And I don't know whether any physics major ever spends any time worrying about rotation after that. The engineers do, obviously. <laughs> All right, guys, I have to say, sorry, this is clearly an animating topic and that's great. Uh, but I think I'm the only remaining host and I do have to go. So I just don't okay. want to like obliterate you all without a uh, warning. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah. yeah, we'll cross And I'll, I'll follow Renita. up with you guys about a uh, uh, future DBIO event. I, I see that um, Catherine has already sent an email uh, to me about this and uh, included Vernita. And so maybe if Lisa, are, if you're interested in this topic, maybe we can figure out what how we might structure something that could be of use and yeah, that'd be great. Fun. And Renita, if you want to talk to me separately, just email me. Okay. Thanks for making it happen, Andrew. Yeah, yep. thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Phil. Thanks. Bye.